Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 133 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away about things you need to know about. Have any reactions to the show? You can email me directly. The uh, email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. Uh, if you do email me, please include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam. And um, be a little patient, a little slow about answering email, but I do answer. You will get an answer. All right, I'm going to go through some things rather quickly because I've got something I want to talk about that's going to take a whole hunk of time, but uh, so I'm going to do some things a little bit quickly. We're going to start, happily, as we always like to when we can, with some good news. Illinois is about to become the 15th state to recognize same-sex marriage. Uh, the State House of Representatives just passed a measure on this on Tuesday. The State Senate had already passed its bill back in February. And Governor Pat Quinn has said all along that he'll sign the measure when it passes. Uh, Same-sex couples in Illinois could start marrying as soon as June 1st. Uh, legislatively, among the states, next up is Hawaii, which could see a vote on this as soon as later this month. Uh, another bit of good news on the privacy front. Last year, in the case U.S. v. Jones, the Supreme Court ruled that for police to attach a GPS tracking device to a car is a search under the Fourth Amendment. But it left open whether it was the type of search that requires a warrant and therefore probable cause, or whether the lesser standard of reasonable suspicion was sufficient. Well, two weeks ago, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in U.S. v. Katzen ruled that the more stringent requirement, the one for a warrant, is the one that applies. Uh, it found that devices such as GPS trackers fly in the face of the protections afforded citizens by the Fourth Amendment. Now, by the way, before I go on here, I have to note something else about this stuff. Uh, other than talking about NSA spying stuff, I haven't talked much about personal privacy of late. Uh, I want to try to correct that in the next few weeks because personal privacy involves a lot more than NSA spying. So I do want to get back to that some. But anyway, moving on, one of our regular weekly features, the outrage of the week. And this week it refers to something that if you're like about 80% of the American public, you didn't even know it was an issue. However, House Speaker John Boner is against it. It, in this case, is the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, or ENDA. ENDA would make it illegal to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, adding those to the list of illegal bases for discrimination, which now consist of race, color, sex, nationality, religion, age, and disability. ENDA is going to pass the Senate this week. It has gotten past all procedural hurdles. It's gotten past all the attempted filibusters. Now, ENDA actually passed the House back in 2007, but that was before the right-wing flakes got control of the place, and John Boner is against ENDA. The thing is, ENDA is popular, or at minimum accepted, by a heavy majority of the American people. According to a poll specifically on ENDA, a heavy majority of registered voters, 68% of them, including 56% of Republicans, approve of such a law. There is majority support for this in every single one of the 50 states. But John Boner is against it. In fact, the idea of such a law is so well accepted that 80% of registered voters thought it already is the law. But John Boner is against it. And that opposition, that opposition standing against the majority of Americans, the majority of Republicans, the majority of people in his own state, could kill the bill again. And that is an outrage. All right, here's the thing that I wanted to talk about, spend most of my time here today. Uh, the week this show is on includes Veterans Day. So this is the time I'm going to include my annual Veterans Day commentary. I've done this either on my blog or here or both for each of the last, well, this will be the sixth year. I've pretty much given up worrying about how it's going to be received. I've tried various ways to start, trying to make sure that I say what I mean and only what I mean. But I've come to accept that there is no way it will not be misunderstood, either accidentally or by some deliberately. 
So I gave up trying to do anything other than just say it flat out because I regard this as an at least useful, if not necessary, counterpoint to the annual hyped praise of all things military and all things veteran. Thing is, November 11th has become so well known as Veterans Day that most people have forgotten that it was originally called Armistice Day. It was intended to commemorate those who died in World War I by the observation of the end of the war, which ended, at least on the Western Front, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. But after World War II and the years following World War II, the U.S. changed its day to call it Veterans Day. And over time, it's become not a commemoration of those who died in war, but a celebration of anyone who's ever been in the military. It has slid from a commemoration of the dead and of peace of the end of a war to a promotion of militarism, to the nobility of sacrifice, and to praise of the true patriots, who are apparently the only true patriots as they are given due unavailable to the rest of us. Now, this actually arose, what originally prompted this back in 2008, uh, was that I was, and I still am in fact, deeply disturbed by the increasing tendency among progressives to adulate all things military, and particularly disturbed by the practice of referring to soldiers routinely as our heroes, or some similar formulation. And I'll note right here, by the way, a, a parenthetical note here, this may be the last time I do this because I don't feel as lonely a voice as it was on this six years ago, or five years ago, rather. Um, and uh, there is some actually now some pushback against the attitude that I'm critiquing here, so it may be the last time for this. But the point is, right now, that attitude still exists. Do a Google search on Soldiers Our Heroes, and you get over 1.1 million hits. Now, the attitude is just more on the right than on the left, not surprisingly, but it still exists even among progressives, and those are the people I'm really addressing here. So let me be clear. Soldiers are not heroes. A hero is by definition someone who is in some way extraordinary, remarkable, someone worthy of emulation. It is at best a risky business to define someone as extraordinary simply by virtue of wearing a uniform, and in fact it's potentially dangerous as it makes it too easy to slip into the militaristic attitude that what soldiers do goes beyond necessary evil, even beyond necessary, uh, and even beyond on, on honorable to something that's admirable, to something that we should celebrate. An attitude that makes it too easy to justify additional enlistments, additional weapons, and additional wars. Now the root of this, the root of this attitude on the left, um, I'm convinced, is that after years of the constant drumbeat from the right, that those on the left are soft on national security, that we aren't tough enough, not ready enough to do what's needed to defend our way of life, that we increasingly decided to, if you will, fight on those terms. That is, we absorb the idea that we have to prove ourselves on security issues by proving that we're tough. Our means of doing this, and this means that first appeared during the Gulf War back in 1990-91, was to declare loudly that we support the troops. That was supposed to be our way into the national security debate, a way to supposedly oppose the war while we declared supporting the men and women sent to fight it. We would prove that we were just as committed to the military and national security as the right, just in a yeah, sort of different way. A perhaps revealing example of that attitude came a couple of years ago during an interview with then-Senator and liberal hero of the month Jim Webb on The Daily Show, uh, the audience for which, both on air and uh, in the studio audience, has a uh, well-recognized lefty tilt. Most of that interview was a discussion about Webb's bill to expand educational benefits for veterans. Uh, under his bill, in return for three years in the military, soldiers would receive four years tuition at their best state college, plus the cost of books, plus a monthly stipend. At one point, Webb said that the least we can do for our soldiers is give them a chance for, quoting, a first-class future, at which point the audience burst into loud uh, and extended applause. And the thing is, I thought then, as I have thought since, would there be any chance, any chance at all, of that same sort of reaction if that same proposal is made about any other group? What if someone proposed paying for four years of college for someone who, say, had been a cop for three years, or a firefighter for three years? 
Uh, what about what about volunteers in Vista or the Peace Corps? Now, those people, actually, those latter two groups, they do get some educational benefits when they finish their time, but nothing vaguely approaching four fully paid years of college. What about what about now uh, publicly funded continuing education for like doctors and nurses? Such continuing education is not only a good idea for healthcare professionals, it's often necessary, a requirement for them to maintain their licenses to practice. And certainly having doctors and nurses who are up to date on the best and latest, best knowledge and practice in their profession is a benefit to the public. So why not have public financing of that, of that extended education? When it comes down to it, why not have public education, tuition-free, taxpayer-supported public education right up through four years of college for anyone who can show themselves capable of meeting the educational standards for a college degree. Can you seriously imagine a studio audience bursting into spontaneous loud applause at the proposal of such an idea? Why only soldiers? What does it say about us that the idea of paying soldiers' way through college gets ovations, while the idea of anyone else getting that same benefit gets at best quizzical stares, if not overt sneering derision? Well, what it says, bluntly, is that we regard the work of soldiering as inherently more important, inherently more deserving of praise and reward than the work of others, no matter what contributions they make or might have made or might make in the future to society. And it means we regard the lives as soldiers as inherently more valuable than the lives of the rest of us. That is the attitude we progressives have been and are buying into when we buy into the soldiers are heroes meme. But the thing is, if it was only things like veterans' benefits, it, it might not seem particularly important. And I say this despite the fact that the cost of those benefits is not insignificant. It runs to something over $60 billion a year. Uh, and the fact is that the arguments for these benefits often are misleading. Uh, many such benefits are actually instituted after World War II and in the years following World War II. And personally, I think part of the reason was memories of the bonus army, which had been just 13 years earlier. The avowed purpose of these benefits was to make up for what the soldiers had lost in regard to their civilian careers as compared to those who had been in the military. That is, they were to ensure that soldiers did not wind up being penalized for having been soldiers. They were not intended to give soldiers a leg up over everyone else, and particularly not a first-class future. And they most definitely were not presented as a reward for being in the military. But that's what they had become over the years and that's how we continue to regard them. Now, right now, I want to make it abundantly clear in case that it's not clear or in case it's willfully ignored that what I'm questioning here is not the right of veterans to get any medical care, rehabilitation, counseling, or whatever that they need as the result of being wounded, either physically or psychologically. And the military's practice of giving soldiers less than honorable uh, discharges just so that they don't have to provide them those benefits is morally outrageous. It's reprehensible. But the fact is, yes, veterans' benefits are too generous to the extent that they become a reward for being in the military, such as veterans' preferences in civil service jobs, and especially when they refer to singling out veterans for opportunities such as for higher education that are becoming increasingly financially impossible for most of the rest of us. Put another way, I do not object to or resent any veteran taking advantage of any benefits to which they are legally entitled. They are there to be used. Go for it. But that notion is born of, of the general ethical principle that I would advocate for the, re, uh, for, the, for the right of anyone to get any help that they truly need regardless of their, let's call it, past employment history. Put yet another way, I am opposed to getting soldiers benefit, uh, getting uh, soldiers getting benefits simply for having been soldiers when those benefits are not equally available to others with equal need and equal opportunity for personal advancement. We're going to take a quick break. And we're back and uh, getting back to what we were talking about before the break. The point is, uh, even if that's all there was to it, even just a matter of veterans' benefits and so on was all there was to it, it still might not seem like such a big deal. But the point is that's not 
all there is to it. Not when we progressives have been trying to lay claim to national security chops by out troops supporting the right, by out Pentagon embracing the right, insisting that we're the ones who really support the troops, we're the ones who really support their brave, courageous efforts, and we look to prove it by undaunted adulation to the point where, with no hint of hesit hesitation, we treat the phrase, uh, have a lot of courage, and the word soldier as synonymous. It was the Iraq War that really brought this out. We were the ones who loudly decried the lack of body, body armor for the troops and the lack of reinforced plating on military vehicles against the threat of IEDs. We accused the right of not supporting the troops as much as we did because of that failure. But as Mark Twain pointed out in the war prayer, quoting him here, if you would beseech a, cur a blessing upon yourself, beware, lest without intent you invoke a curse upon a neighbor at the same time. If you pray for the blessing of rain upon your crop which needs it, by that act you are possibly praying for a curse upon some neighbor's crop which may not need rain and can be injured by it. Thing is, in war, in combat, as long as the soldiers are there, there is an unavoidable trade-off. The more you wish for them to remain safe, the more you were wishing for them to kill others. That's what safety in combat means. The more we wish for our people to return safely, the more we wish for Iraqis not to. The more we wish life for the ones, the more we wish death for the others. The more we wish that American mothers, fathers, wives, husbands, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons didn't suffer the loss of a family member, the more we wished that Iraqi mothers, fathers, wives, husbands, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons did. That's what war means. But we refused and we continued to refuse to see that. So we, ex so we expressed support for the troops by demanding we give them the equipment to do the job and then get them home safely, rather than saying, get them the hell out. We offered a tacit and sometimes not so tacit endorsement of the killing. For the sake of the blessing of safety and life for our soldiers, we called on the curse of risk and death on Iraqis. When we declared our support of equipment rather than withdrawal, that is what we endorsed. In war, there is no other way. Undoubtedly, there are those who would be prepared to declare that American lives are inherently worth more than Iraqi ones, or Afghan ones, or Pakistani ones, or anywhere where our drones are now targeted. I was not and am not among those people. And I like to think that I'm part of a movement that would say the same if it would only to, quote Twain again, pause and think. But I suspect that we have done neither. The emotional embrace of soldiers as our heroes, as some sort of disembodied ideal, has implications beyond the immediate ones, beyond as well the immediate experience of our recent and present wars. Within that embrace, it becomes so easy to absorb, to absorb to the point you're not even aware of it. The idea that a veteran's take on military matters, and by extension all of national security and all of foreign policy, is inherently more valuable than any others, uh, not by virtue of knowledge or logic or informed comment, but simply by virtue of being a veteran. We regarded it quite correctly as a scandal several years ago when uh, media outlets used retired generals who actually were Pentagon trained PR flax as experts on foreign and military policy questions. But an overlooked point there is that one of the reasons that retired generals are so prominent among that number is that their status as military people gave them added credibility in the eyes of the general public. In our pursuit of support the troops, we have fallen prey to that same attitude, one that regards the statements as war ve of war veterans as more valuable, more telling than those of non-veterans. It even became fairly common to hear dismissive references to those who never saw combat. At first, now, actually, that was a legitimate argument because it was directed against the people called chicken hawks, those right-wingers who were eager for a fight, eager for a war, as long as they didn't have to fight it. But increasingly, it was used as an all-purpose put-down, even against those on the left who criticize soldiers. As I expect, it would be used against me, um, a non-veteran and a Vietnam-era draft resistor, were my voice loud enough to attract the attention. But the real danger is that as that attitude persists, it distorts our way of thinking. It drops a magnet on our moral compass. In a bizarre mirror image of the fanatical right, during the Iraq war, we refused to blame soldiers who committed atrocities, or more exactly, we refused to acknowledge them.
We refused to blame those who shot civilians, even when they were clearly acts of vengeance. We downplayed the war crimes and the routine cruelties. We made excuses for those who shot the wounded or tortured prisoners, even when an official Pentagon report casually mentioned how a U.S. soldier summarily executed a wounded fighter and shot another wounded, unresisting fighter in the back twice. We paid little notice. And if we did, it was usually to brush off complaints with that all-purpose, you've never been in combat defense. These things happen in war, we said. Yes, they do. And our heroes were doing them. Which was and is, even as the deniers seemed and still seem incapable of realizing it, is the point. Just as the right tried to blame the individuals and exonerate the hierarchy, we wanted to blame the hierarchy and exonerate the individuals to remove all the responsibility for their own actions. That is an idea we were supposed to have rejected. It's getting close to 70 years ago now, but apparently we haven't. Soldiers are not heroes. They can be heroes. They can become heroes. They can act heroically. They can do heroic things. But the act of putting on a uniform and agreeing to put your conscience in a lockbox for the next so many years does not make your life more important than others. It does not make your contributions more valuable than others. It does not make you more deserving of aid than others. It does not make your opinions and insights more worthy of respect than others. It does not exempt you from moral judgment. It does not make you a hero. And we should not fall prey to hero worship. All right, moving on from that to something else. Have you heard the latest on the listening? Uh, the listening, of course, in this case, being that done by the NSA, which is now busily defending every new discovery about its policies and practices by invoking the magic talisman 9-11 as part of a conscious PR strategy. And yes, it is conscious. A master list of NSA talking points obtained by Al Jazeera through a Freedom of Information uh, Act filing uh, has 9-11 references at the top of a listing of sound bites that resonate, such as... I much prefer to be here today explaining these programs and explaining another 9-11 that we were unable to prevent. Now, as I said last week, this is crapola. Despite claims that the previously secret programs had stopped 54 terrorist plots, NSA Director Keith Starship Captain Alexander admitted last month that only in quoting him one or possibly two of those cases did the massive spying make any difference. And Senator Ron Weidenmark Udall said the NSA spying uh, played little or no role, quote unquote, in those 54 cases. But anyway, that was last week. What's the new stuff? Well, it's this. Uh, a week ago, the Washington Post reported that the NSA has secretly broken into the main links connecting Google and Yahoo data centers around the world. This gives them unrestricted access to everything, and I mean everything, moving through the networks of either of those internet giants. And I do mean everything. The Post reports that an internal NSA document uh, dated January 9, 2013, and among those released by Edward Snowden, says that in the preceding 30 days, field collectors had processed and sent back over 181 million new records, ranging from metadata, which indicates who sent or received emails and when they did, to actual content such as text, audio, and video. The Post also says that when two Google techies were shown this image from a National Security Agency presentation on a, a Google cloud exploitation, they, quote, exploded in profanities. Now, I'm sure part of the reason for that uh, for that reaction is that we've heard about PRISM. This is the NSA's program to tap into the servers of a number of major internet companies to extract data. Now, however, that refers at least hypothetically to data the companies either willing to give up in response to a request or unwilling in response to an order from the secret FISA court. You might well call PRISM the front door. The companies knew about it. This new revelation under a project called Muscular is the back door. This is not someone at the front door looking for a donation. This is a sneak thief breaking the back door to steal anything that looks good to them. It's the embezzler who tries to drain the stuff away without you even knowing it's going on. Now, no, of course, the data doesn't actually disappear from the cloud. It just copied, but the point is the same. Companies who thought they were cooperating with the feds learned that their data is being ripped off behind their backs. Now, the data links being exploited, of course, are outside the U.S., 
where, thanks to the rigorous oversight of congressional leaders and our carefully crafted laws, the NSA can pretty much do whatever dang thing it wants, because after all, if the data is outside the U.S., it must be about foreigners, which of course makes absolutely no sense, but don't worry about it, because the NSA swears it doesn't ever, ever, ever spy on Americans, no siree, honest to gosh. Don't you feel better? That actually leads us into right into our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity, where we have a tie. Two very deserving winners, both related to the spying. The first big red nose goes to Senator Chris Murphy, who reacted to news about anger among European governments over NSA spying on their people and their leaders by saying he's going to go to Europe to dish out some tough love and make it clear to Europeans that they need to stay on board with us because it's really important for U.S. national security interests. In other words, hey Europeans, shut up. So says the clown, Chris Murphy. Our second big red nose goes to the NSA's enabler-in-chief in the Congress, the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Dianne Feinstein. This past week, she rejected the idea of clemency for Edward Snowden, claiming that if he had been a true whistleblower, he could have reported things to her committee privately. Now, leave aside the fact that it's not up to Dianne Feinstein to define who is and isn't a whistleblower, especially when the definition term, uh, the, uh, the, the term itself, the definition, refers to someone who, quote, informs on another or makes public disclosure of corruption or wrongdoing, unquote, not someone who gives secrets to the secrets keepers. Just consider... Rather, that when the leaks started to be revealed, Feinstein was out there claiming to all and sundry that she already knew all this stuff, that everyone should just not bother their pretty little heads about it because it was all under control and her committee was thoroughly briefed and kept informed and did strict oversight. So, just what was it that Snowden was supposed to tell them? Well, in fact, was he supposed to know in advance what the committee did and didn't know? Because it turns out the committee didn't know it all, or at least that's what Feinstein is now claiming uh, about the spying on leaders of U.S. allies. She discovered that the White House was keeping things from her, that the Director of National Intelligence and the Director of the NSA were lying to her and to her committee, and she's only found out about this because of Edward Snowden. And her response was to repeat her charge that he is a traitor. Now that is a clown. All right, that's it for this week. I'm going to end up with our regular weekly reminder, and we have reached a milestone. As of November 5th, at least 10,237 Americans have been killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown, at least 90 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. We'll see you next week.